The future of hemp and legal practices. Four cannabis policy and regulatory lanes. Global opportunities. Domestic distribution as economic driver. European Union. The new paradigm. Legalization and regulatory challenges. President and founder of Hoban Law Group and Gateway Proven Strategies from the United States of America, Bob Hoban. Hello and good morning, everybody. My name is Bob Hoban. I am the founder of the Hoban Law Group um, and the founder and president of Gateway Proven Strategies, uh, our global consulting firm, uh, and the uh, host of the Hoban Minute. Uh, the podcast that uh, we launched back in February, which has gained a lot of attention during COVID to be an informational source during the, um, the COVID pandemic. Um, the Hoban Law Group is the largest cannabis only law firm in the world with over 67 attorneys in 10 different countries focusing only on this industry. I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about the hemp industry and where hemp is today. Um, and where it's going, and some of the observations on a global stage that uh, I wanted to share with you. Um, particularly as we sit here and we talk about Southeast Asia, Thailand in particular, moving forward with a hemp program, and hemp is literally sweeping the world for a variety of uses. And I would suggest very strongly to everyone that's on this webinar that hemp is and will continue to be the backbone of the global cannabis supply chain. And when I say cannabis supply chain, some folks use the word cannabis to refer to marijuana. Of course, cannabis is the plant. The plant has two sides as an industry. It has the industrial hemp side and the marijuana side of the industry. And I'm here to talk to you about the industrial hemp side. But I, I do believe, and I'll suggest, and we'll discuss this over the next 25 minutes, that hemp will be the backbone of the entire cannabis supply chain, not just food, fuel, fibers, or industrial uses, but wellness and medicines as well. Now, of course, the hemp plant can perform a variety of functions. It's historically been recognized as having over 50,000 uses from one plant. So we're seeing enormous crops being planted across the United States, across the entirety of North America, and across Latin America in the Western Hemisphere, planting hemp at an unrealized pace that we've never seen in history to realize a number of different things. Now, when we look at the different sectors that the hemp plant services, of course, there's food. The grain from the hemp plant has enormous quantities of protein and there are protein deficiencies in countries all over the world. That protein deficiency has been exacerbated by the food supply chain being interrupted during COVID. So for food purposes, hemp is and will continue to be a major player on the protein side of the hemp food supply chain. When you look at livestock food and bedding, uh, that is an emerging market in the United States and has been a market for hemp derived products across the European Union for a number of years. Look at hemp plastics. We're seeing hemp plastics being used across the world right now and scientific technology moving forward with ways to increase the amount. We, uh, on behalf of a client, sent a sample of hemp biomass material to our partners at a university in Texas. And that Texas university within 10 days was able to use their existing patent information and produce translucent, meaning see-through plastic made 90% from industrial hemp. And that is something that we're seeing a lot more of. Talk about body care products, talk about paper products, Talk about medical products like CBD and oil, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and nutritional supplements, and of course, fabrics and oils when we talk about fuel. In the United States, the first ethanol, meaning fuel not based primarily on fossil fuels or oil, was made with industrial hemp, and we're starting to see that regain uh, its rightful stage yet again. 
So if we look at the investment world, we look at all point solutions in the cannabis market, but we don't look at the supply chain. And this is very important for those of you watching this, understanding and saying, maybe I want to get a license. Maybe I have a license in a particular country. But it's important to understand that most countries, most countries around the world that are growing cannabis, whether that's marijuana or hemp, those are for export purposes. Okay, and increasing legislation is looking at ways to export for for those international exportation purposes. So it's un, it's important to understand that if you're going to try to get or if you're going to get a license, if you're going to raise money for a license, you need critically to understand how to place your license in context of this global supply chain because it exists right here today. Too many folks are investing in brands, support system and processing facilities without regard to the sustainability of this ecosystem. So let's talk about the hemp ecosystem momentarily. Let's talk about the grain elements of it. Do you know that a, fa a farmer in the United States can plant one acre of hemp and make more on that one acre by gross value than they had made from planting corn or wheat or other traditional crops right now, today. Fiber, fiber can be gleaned from the hemp plant through a decortication process. And that fiber, as many of us know, is extraordinarily strong fiber. And with modern technology, that fiber can be used to produce soft clothing, not just hard, really durable, um, uh, industrial hemp fiber material. That fiber has a variety of other uses as well. The problem with the fiber uh, production currently is that the decortication and processing facilities are not located in enough places around the world close to the farmers so that it makes it worthwhile, but we're seeing that infrastructure being built. The keef, uh, keef as it's known, the cannabinoids, the trichomes, the crystals that are on the flowers and the exterior of the stems of the plant produced from the resins of the plant. Those crystals contain cannabinoids and terpenes. Cannabinoids are what yields to the production of CBD, cannabidiol, one of the world's most popular ingredients right now. CBN, CBG, a variety of 120 plus cannabinoids, including THC, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. The plant also contains high levels of cellulose, lignin, and sugars that can be used as building blocks for plastic, for paper, for fuels. The sugar from the plant is being used and will continue to be used as xylitol, as an alternative natural sweetener, and or produce into spirits. So the, this plant is extraordinarily useful, even the THC. Now we look at industrial hemp and we say industrial hemp has a THC limit, but that definition is by dry weight, meaning by plant material. So if that plant material contains 0.3%, and I've grown upwards of 100 acres, let alone if I grew a thousand acres or hectares of that plant material, 0.3% of that material is a lot of THC. That's enough THC to sell into programs by major pharmaceutical companies around the world to produce medicine and medicinal formulas. Yes, from the hemp plant, because that's what pharmaceutical producers do. They isolate the components and create formulas. So from a medical perspective, I would bet that the backbone, the supply chain for THC, producing 0.3% of up to 12 metric tons per acre, that isn't a lot of THC, particularly on a scaled farm moving forward. Let's look at the global supply chain and the development. And like I said, and I wanna stress this, it's extremely important that you understand where you fit in this global cannabis supply chain, because if you don't understand your piece, you wanna understand who your buyer is, where you're shipping it to, what standards or qualifications you need to grow your material under so that it can be purchased, received, and otherwise distributed into the global cannabis supply chain. Now, there are four policy or regulatory lanes surrounding the cannabis plant. So the cannabis sativa 
plant, the genus, the species, industrial uses. Industrial uses are the first lane. That's where we use the material for, for processes that do not involve human consumption. It involves producing paper, building materials, plastics, fuels, and so forth. The fiber uses for textiles, for example. The second swim lane, the second lane for policies from the one plant is OTC or over-the-counter marijuana. This has, is what we've seen in distribution across the United States in what, what's known as dispensaries uh, and across Europe in distribution outlets such as what we've seen in Germany and other countries and in Latin America also being distributed through pharmacies and other over-the-counter channels. But those products are marijuana products that contain above 0.3% THC. Oftentimes they're converted into oils or distillates for use uh, and convenience of use by consumers. The third lane, the third policy lane from the one cannabis plant is the wellness, the nutraceuticals, the food lane. In other words, products that are intended to provide a wellness or health benefit to the human body. These materials are more often than not derived from industrial hemp, non-psychoactive cannabinoids such as CBD, such as CBG, distributed in stores all around the world, sold online all around the world, meeting that insatiable demand for CBD from regular consumers. These products contain very little below 0.3% or 0. 0.000 something percent THC, depending on where they're distributed. They're served as food products. They're served as wellness products or supplements, oftentimes known as nutraceuticals, as that space in between food products and pharmaceuticals the nutraceutical or the supplement lane tends to exist in the middle. And then the fourth policy lane to be aware of is the pharmaceutical lane. In other words, taking those materials, converting those compounds into isolated or distilled forms and creating formulations that are prescribed by physicians produced for specific conditions in specific formulas and approved by governments. You'll find if you mark these four lanes in your head that every cannabis policy that you're exposed to country by country by country falls into one of these four lanes, oftentimes more than one of these four lanes. But it's imperative for you to understand that so you can understand the context. Some countries only allow industrial use. Some countries like the United States allow all four uses. Some countries are focused on pharmaceutical uses only. Some folks are interested in supplying one of these four channels. So once you begin to identify what your country, your destination for your purchaser, what policies they have in place, you'll be able to cultivate, produce, process, and export material for use in those lanes. But it's critical for you to understand how that's evolved. There are global opportunities in this space. The hemp supply chain, like the marijuana supply chain, but the marijuana supply chain is on a much smaller scale right now. The hemp supply chain is indeed global. If we look at North America, Canada has historically been a major leader globally, second only to China, in the production of industrial hemp primarily for fiber and grain uses. In other words, the food and textile or industrial uses. Canada now regulates the cannabis plant by use. In other words, if I took those same hemp plants in Canada and I derived, took out, extracted CBD from those plants, the Health Canada system regulates the use product coming out of those plants with a very rigorous um, set of regulations that require safety data um, and move forward to making sure that those products put into the marketplace are safe and consistent for consumers. The US, however, the largest CBD or non-psychoactive cannabinoid market in the world presently does not put those safeguards in place presently for industrial hemp. Now in the United States, like in Canada, and like in so many places around the world, um, designates legally industrial hemp as a 
cannabis sativa plant with less than 0.3% per, uh, THC. If it's greater than THC, uh, 0.3%, it's determined to be marijuana. If it's below, it's determined to be industrial hemp. And many countries around the world are following this distinction. Some, however, have just regulated cannabis outright. Some have used that 0.3% and raised it to 1% or even 1.5% in various jurisdictions. And we'll talk a little bit about the reasons why having a higher THC percentage does not necessarily give you a competitive advantage, even though, even though those plants might be more efficient at producing cannabinoids. Now I see very much as Latin America as the greatest opportunity in the marketplace globally right now. Southeast Asia is an emerging market with a stigma around this plant for uses that we've seen in the Western hemisphere, although a long history of using this plant for many, many, many uses. But the reason I highlight Latin America is because over the last several years, we've seen the European Union become the place where everybody was trying to get their products, second only to the United States for non-psychoactive cannabinoids, CBD type uses. The Latin American marketplace has evolved dramatically from several three and four and five years ago to export only to now we have Brazil, a country with well over 212 million people and its nationalized healthcare system advocating for the use of non-psychoactive cannabinoids to be distributed in conjunction with that system. We're seeing the same thing happen in Mexico with 135, 140 plus million people. We see the same notion occur in Colombia. Those three countries alone exceed 400 million people, especially when you add the prospect of Argentina joining the ranks and those nationalized healthcare systems being on board for distribution, promulgation, support, and use. So those countries in Latin America, which does not exclude the Caribbean in terms of it's just a much smaller marketplace with fewer population numbers, those things are what I'm seeing that is extraordinarily exciting outside of the United States. In the United States, we've seen uh, the CBD market, the demand exists, but because of the uh, fewer and fewer regulations, right? Regulations on this plant that ultimately um, allow for, for distribution in stores without the FDA putting out regulations either like Health Canada or otherwise, then you're looking at a system where there is no export only. Uh, there is no marketplace for mainstream retail where you can distribute these materials. So at the end of the day, um, I do think the Latin American market is something to watch and I would understand from a contextual perspective and it is definitely a place that you wanna go. Now, let's look at domestic distribution as an economic driver because as I mentioned, many of these Latin American countries formulated policies that said export only. But then all of a sudden you're flipping that on its head and you're saying we're allowed to distribute this domestically within Mexico soon to be, within Brazil, within Colombia, and you have the support of those nationalized healthcare systems, I can't stress how significant that is in terms of mainstream acceptance, mainstream use, and the pathway towards integrating non-psychoactive cannabinoids into uh, use by uh, everyday people along the way. Now, this domestic distribution is in fact an economic driver. At the beginning of COVID, we saw a country's president like Costa Rica come out and say, we're going to legalize industrial hemp so that we can drive the economy forward during this economic downturn surrounding the pandemic using Canyamo or industrial hemp. We're talking about countries like Colombia, countries advancing policies like Brazil, like Argentina, Ecuador, proud to say, being involved with, with that country's uh, progressive legislation on this which just happened weeks ago. So many of these Latin American countries are moving forward with not only an export model, but a domestic distribution model that is seen as an economic driver in this post COVID or COVID impacted economic environment. And there's hundreds and hundreds of million, million people uh, that are available as consumers, as patients, as purchasers, uh, understanding the context in which you're situated. Now, if we look at the European Union, uh, ultimately, the EU 
is a very interesting place because the demand was huge and it continues to be huge, although regulatory chaos exists, not just in the EU, but across the world as it relates to non-psychoactive cannabinoids. Even though the European Union has been a world leader in many ways in the hemp production in the aggregate uh, and hemp uses historically, uh, it's amount of uh, regulated distribution outlets, retail stores has gone down dramatically. And I'll tell you why it has to do with that regulatory uncertainty. We were able to get several of our clients into tens of thousands of stores across European countries. About eight to 12,000 of those stores were mainstream brick and mortar stores with multiple divisions, multiple outlets. That all reversed course when in the threat of litigation, from consumer groups who said, how can you be selling this stuff when it's not yet regulated uh, as an ingredient or as a product by the European Commission? Those stores took those products off the shelf. What was once well over 10,000 is now under 3,000 in terms of regulated out outlets across the European Union. Um, and we continue to monitor that. Now, before I get to the, the, the new paradigm and we talk about the European Union, the European Union months ago was set to treat this like a novel food ingredient, meaning a new dietary ingredient to be put into food products, um, proving its safety, demonstrating that the product is not harmful. Now, there was a lot of disagreement about whether, in fact, it's a new food product, a new food ingredient, and then that, that line in the sand, so to speak, was set out. But at the end of the day, what happened was the European Union a few months ago reversed course and began to consider treating non-psychoactive cannabinoids such as CBD as a narcotic. Now we've seen a place like Italy start on the narcotic track and then reversing course and saying, we're gonna treat it like a food product. We've seen a number of countries across the European Union go back and forth between these designations. And that answer is not done yet but stay tuned because what happens in Europe will determine whether or not you can sell your products. I just wanna to suggest to you that using the whole plant is what ultimately will get you and keep you in this industry and understanding how to operate within cross-border transactions is extremely critical, operating with customs, phytosanitary requirements and certificates and registration across the board. So. My time is up. Uh, I hope you found this to be somewhat informative. Uh, I'm excited to see the progress that comes out of Southeast Asia as it relates to non-psychoactive cannabinoids and hemp, uh, particularly in Thailand. Uh, and if anybody has any questions at all, please feel free to reach out.